Hello, hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about regression. I chose to go straight with two predictors because I cover most of what we need to know about regression with one predictor, so just two continuous variables, X and Y, in the video on correlation. For those of you who know me, I will insist as always on the importance of looking at the big picture, the importance of building the confidence we have in what our data are telling us, rather than producing a p-value, which can be very misleading if we are not careful. In a nutshell, we apply a regression when we are looking at this type of data, and we want the regression to give us answers to two questions. Question one, is there a relationship between X and Y, or more specifically, to what extent can we predict Y with X? And question two, is the relationship between X and Y different between the two conditions? First of all, let me remind you about the difference between correlation and regression. A correlation is telling us about the nature and the strength of an association, whereas the regression is telling us about nature and strength too, but also about the prediction. It's telling us the extent to which X can predict Y. A regression will give us the equation of the line of best fit. So to build that line of best fit, we need to think about residuals. A residual is basically the difference between each point and the predicted value. It is what is left once we have built a model, work out a prediction, so quite literally a residue. Now, we need to find the equation which is going to summarize best the relationship between X and Y. In other words, we want to find the values for A and B that minimize the residuals, the line that fits the best, haha. <laughs> As I often say, stats vocabulary usually contains its own meaning. Okay, so residuals are also referred to as errors, and from there comes the expression sum of squared errors, or sum of squares in short. When we say that we want to minimize the residuals, quantitatively it translates into we want the sum of squares to be as small as possible. I explain more about sum of squares in the video on descriptive statistics. Let's go back to the line of best fit, which is, like I said, about choosing values for A and B that minimize the sum of squares. So time to talk about these parameters. A is the slope, often referred to as the coefficient. Basically, it is the number of units that the line moves along the y-axis for each unit it moves along the x-axis. As for B, it is the intercept or constant. It is the point at which the line cuts or intercepts the y-axis at x equals zero. Okay, now it's time to talk about one of my favorite things, R square. It is really one of the coolest parameters there is. So we need to take a step back and speak a bit more about model and sum of squares. Say we have a bunch of data which are telling us something about the relationship between X and Y. The simplest model we think of to summarize this data is the mean. And to have an idea about how good a fit it is to our data, we use the sum of squares, classic. Let's call it SST with T for total. The total viability in our data before we really try to summarize the pattern we see. Because we know we can do better than the mean, right? We could try a regression, for instance, with the line of best fit, which is the equivalent of the mean, as in it is summarizing the data, but we hope does a better job at it. Again, we work out the sum of squares, this time associated with the regression. Now, if we want to quantify the improvement associated with our model, all we have to do is subtract the sum of squares for the regression from the one for the mean. It gives us the model sum of squares, which is simply the difference between the two predictions from the mean and from the regression. The bigger the value, the bigger the improvement. And R square expresses it as a proportion, for it is the ratio of the model sum of squares over the total one. So R2, which is also called the coefficient of determination, by the way, is simply the proportion of variance in Y that can be explained by X, often expressed in percentages. Now, let me show you why I find R square so great. 
Say we have this data here and we think, okay, there is a pattern, a negative relationship between the two variables, a negative relationship which seems strong and steady. One way to check it out is to draw a line of best fit. And speaking of it, it is a really good one, right? Now, how good exactly? Well, that's what the R square tells us. And here it is 76%. So a little more than three quarters of the viability of variable two is explained by variable one, which is quite a lot. And it makes sense when we look at it. Now, what about this data? We still see a negative relationship between the two variables, but not as strong. And it is confirmed with R square, which this time is 46%. And again, it makes sense, for we see that there is more to variable 2 than its relationship with variable 1. I hope you can see how R square is informative, how just one value tells us so much about the relationship between our data and the model we chose to summarize them. I love it. And here we pause, as like always, whenever we apply some stats on our data, we have to check that we are going for the right approach, or that our data are behaving the way they should. So it's time to think about the assumptions associated with the regression. And the nice thing here is that it is pretty straightforward. Basically, we have to think about normality. Both variables should be continuous, of course, and normally distributed. And since we are drawing a line between X and Y, well, it's important that there is a linear relationship between the two variables. And to check that, we can go back to the residuals. If our model is the right one, then we should expect the values to be kind of symmetrically distributed on either side of the line, which would translate if we were to actually plot the residuals into a normal distribution. I talk more about it in the video on goodness of fit, by the way. Okay, so to recapitulate, to answer the questions associated with this type of data, we need to draw a line of best fit and we need R square. As for the difference between the two fits, the two models, it is really the two slopes that we want to compare. So let's do it. We are going to look at the relationship between parasite and body mass in males and females raw deer. Even though, strictly speaking, regression is about a fixed x and a random y, the technique is routinely applied to a wider range of quantitative variables. As always, to do stats in PRISM is really easy. We choose linear regression, of course, and then we tick compare for the comparison between the two slopes and residual plot to check the assumption for normality. So we get this graph, which we already know. PRISM has drawn for us the two lines of best fit. That was its job. Our job is to check that it's the right way to summarize the data, that it is the right model, the right fit, really. So first, we look at the residuals. These are the actual residuals, so quite simply the differences. It follows that we want them to be randomly and symmetrically distributed on either side of zero, which is what we see here. So, so far, so good. Now, let's have a look at the results. Okay, so first we have the best fit values, which are used to build the equation. We can see that the coefficient values are consistent with the graph. The slope is steeper for the males than for the females. We then have some measures of confidence for these values, like the standard error, the confidence interval, which is really informative. Like here, if zero is not between the limits, it means that zero is not a possible value for the slope, and it follows that we can expect significance for the males. You can find some more information about confidence intervals in the video on descriptive statistics. Then we get the R square, totally cool. Here we can see that 56% of the viability in body mass is explained by the parasite load in males versus only 9% in females. That is an important piece of information as it suggests that there is a big difference between males and females. And finally, the two p-values, which we already guessed from the confidence intervals, significant for the males, but not for the females. We also get the p-values associated with the slopes. To the question, are the slopes equal, PRISM answers yes, or rather, there is no significant difference between the two genders. So, from these data, we can conclude that there is a negative association between X and Y, and even though it appears stronger in males, the difference between the genders is not significant. Now, one last thing, looking at this data, looking at the difference between the two R-squares, looking at the difference between the slopes, we get a feeling that the pattern we observe here is important, so could well be that we miss significance because we forgot to think about power. 
Remember, we should never interpret p-values outside the context of the experiment, and in particular, outside the context of power. Thank you for listening, and don't forget, stats don't have to be scary.